Hey everybody, it's November, we're back, and uh, we got a lot of war games, RPGs, card games, skirmish stuff, all that kind of craziness in the board game space ready to go for you. Published about once a week, sometimes a little bit more depending on how much stuff is there. And uh, there is so much in November, just like in October. October we had to do seven episodes to get through all of it. I wouldn't be that surprised. There's already stuff stacking up due in December. Everybody wants your money. Everybody wants to get you before Black Friday gets you. So uh, let's get started. First up is Europa Universalis. This is a board game version of a PC game that came out in the early 90s. Lots of uh, cards and uh, it's a 4X game. Uh, I don't necessarily feel that uh, board games are always the best way to approach PC games just because PC games can handle a lot of the little uh, tiny rules a lot better but uh, you know and another thing is the 4x games took so much time especially back that then to play that I'm hoping they've got it streamlined it says 90 plus minutes but if the minimum is 90 that means you're gonna have a lot of time on there uh, one advantage here is that you do have uh, one to six players so there's a solo mode or you can expand it pretty far out there uh, components look pretty good artwork looks pretty good I haven't played Europa but in the uh, 90s, that was kind of like the heyday of uh, those 4X strategy games. They were super awesome. So as long as they basically port the, the same kind of thing over, it should work fine. There's no minis or anything. It's almost like Risk where uh, you just have uh, the map itself and uh, of the different countries and you uh, push the stuff back and forth. So uh, it's super popular. There's about $300,000 already put into this campaign. So you wouldn't be the only one if you wanted to jump in and have that 90s nostalgia. Back again, we have Hard West. This has been on our list for two or three times now, and uh, it doesn't look like they've made the minis any better, which was my main criticism from before. But otherwise, it looks like a neat little uh, old western town that's haunted, and you have to face off against stuff. Um, I, it looks pretty close to funding this time, so with the last couple days ready to go, there's usually a big uptick. Uh, Silver Lynx has been trying real hard to get this one out. It's been many months uh, since the first time we've seen it, and uh, this might finally be your opportunity to pick it up if you were interested in it. Uh, like I did, the minis, they're okay. They're not great, but they're okay. And if you wanted to, you can replace them with other stuff. Uh, but the game itself looked like it might be fun. Then from Weird West to Sci-Fi, we have Omicron Protocol. This is a squad-based uh, minis game that does have a solo mode. Uh, one of the things that's kind of innovative, if you do play multiplayer, then there is an AI faction. It's not really AI, but it switches uh, its control between the players. So on your opponent's turn, they mess with you. On your turn, they mess with them. It, uh, it's kind of like uh, billiards in a, in a way where you move the balls around. And you make it less, uh, if you can't get the, the ball in, then you make it less advantageous for your opponent uh, by moving the ball to a different uh, position, which is kind of a, an innovative um, mechanic in this space. So the minis look pretty cool. There's different factions, like you can play animals or you can play various uh, stereotypical um, modern to uh, you know, future versions of things. Uh, so that part's pretty neat. Take a quick look at it. There's also a um, luck mitigation system so that your die rolls come out well. And uh, that's one of the things like with the uh, Sadler Brothers of Blacklist games, always having your die rolls do something for you uh, keeps the game fun. So that part's neat. I'm going to guess that the solo mode plays against the neutral faction, um, but the components all look pretty good. Then we have an RPG that's supposed to take place in what it says is historical uh england um but yeah wolves of god adventures in dark ages england i'm not really sure that putting wolves of god uh making it seem religious is the way to go for marketing um but uh maybe if you have a group that uh or parents or something that's not into dungeons and dragons because they think oh it's, it's all the evils it's all the evils um, then maybe something like this will still let you play a little bit of it because uh, it takes more of the the pro uh, from what it looks like Christianity uh, take uh, as using Christianity against the bad guys. So 
uh, if this is in, in your wheelhouse, if this is something that looks like it would be neat to you, if you're part of that particular uh, religious bend, then uh, Wolves of God may be something that uh, you can play that you're not getting from one of the other, uh, the other uh, games out there. I never want to see someone leave a sale on the table by limiting themselves by the story. This Amazing Tales does the opposite of that, which is really cool. Um, it's just a big book of all different types of adventures. If you want to play high fantasy, if you want to play a pirate, uh, there's different types of games uh, available for all that cool stuff. Um, anything that you're basically looking for in a, uh, a fun little uh, quick time. The uh, artwork is very kid friendly. Uh, and you know, that might not, it might not be limited just to the kids, um, but, uh, it might be easy enough to uh, approach. So if you need something that, uh, skews a little younger, uh, and plays, you know, without just all the de demons and devils and all the other stuff, but still has the, the dragons and whatnot, then, uh, look into Amazing Tales for a fun little adventure. Then we have, uh, Doakite, which is the opposite of that, <laughs> where you, in, the uh, Amazing Adventures were made for a wide audience. This is made for a very small audience. This is an RPG that uh, Doakite means hereness, and it is uh, something that was brought in in the Bundism, secular Zionist movement. Um, it means uh, thinking about where you're at here and now. And uh, so this is something for people to explore the concept of Jewishness um yeah so if that's something you're interested in something you want to look at then uh, and you need an rpg uh dedicated to that i can see why you wouldn't want to use necessarily 5e or or uh, apocalypse or whatever rules because um this could be an exploration of things that are not necessarily going towards combat but maybe it's towards some other type of uh, role-playing uh issue that uh, takes place specifically within this uh, social group so, uh, yeah, if you need Dokite, then uh, it's there for you. It's getting close to winter, and everyone's going to have something religious for the holidays, right? But this has nothing to do with that. We're back on the regular stuff. The Pocket Companion Guide to Cities and Towns. So if you need some uh, interesting town or, or settlement or anything in your uh, campaign, and you don't really have anything set up, or you just need something to make the story work, then uh, that's what this is for. So... It gives you just quick ideas, something that you can visit. And, uh, you know, if you did use one of these in your campaigns, then you can just pull the card back out and uh, you won't have to try to remember all the stuff that was happened before. Or you can pull it out with uh, future characters and, you know, really make it live. And you won't have to spend your time being a city planner. You can just be more into the story than anything else. Easy to slot in with all the other uh, fun stuff. There's NPC guides and things on this list and you can get from other... Uh, campaigns as well, other places in your uh, friendly local game store that uh, will all slot together pretty well. So if you need something that is uh, interesting for uh, just a new town, if you think yours are lackluster or you just don't want to put in the work, that's what this pocket companion is here for. Another thing you can do on the holidays is eat way too much and that's what Scofton is about. This is a worker placement game that has set collection and a little bit of take that uh, about an all you can eat buffet. So this is about filling your plate and uh, getting all the good and best stuff and taking it from others and uh, doing everything you can to uh, get make the uh, best, I guess, uh, most nutritious, most tasty grouping of, uh, of foods on your plate. So, yeah, something uh, everyone can enjoy. And uh, coming out of Australia for uh, cheap shipping down there, if that's something you guys are used to. I don't know if Scofton is a restaurant that's down in uh, Australia, but it could be. Otherwise, it's uh, it's that's what it is. Just a uh, neat little game with some meeples to uh, to feed yourself with. Then we have Stellar Horizons. This is a 4x game that takes place in the modern space race. It goes about 150 years into the future, but uh, you build your tech tree and everything else based off of what we have today. It is made by a SpaceX engineer as part of the group, and uh, that seems like a pretty good bona fides to uh, to get started with. Uh, take a quick look at it. It has some interesting ships. It has uh, a lot of different cool ideas about what would happen in the future. And uh, if you have a space nerd in the group, then you can't beat it. Take a quick look at Stellar Horizons.
Then we have Foodie Frenzy. We're back to the food stuff. And this is a three to six player game, so keep that part in mind. Um, and the components and everything that on the, the kits that they're showing uh, look pretty cheap, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but I think those are just paper copies uh, for their own prototyping. I'm hoping the final product will be a lot better. Um, you have this pepper grinder that you're supposed to grab. You have uh, plates that you're sitting there and you're uh, trying to screw up people's food. Um, similar to the uh, Scofton, you're trying to mess each other up in a take that situation. But you have that dexterity and speed uh, added in. And uh, for whatever reason, you have cats also thrown in to um, distract people. So, uh, yeah, those are all uh, fun little options and different things. Uh, it says EU friendly. I don't know if the food is all going to be EU stuff or uh, if it's going to come from, uh, I mean, I see what possibly is a tempura shrimp. Hopefully there's a big universal group of it. But, uh, you know, if there's no Mexican food in there, I'm going to be, you know, a little a little off put because that is the best food in the world. Come on now. Then for the really little kids, we have Funny Fairies. This is a game that, uh, you know, it's about teaching body parts and colors and all that kind of stuff. So uh, spinner's easy so they don't have to roll dice. It is made for kids three and up probably need to play it with them though because there is a little bit of uh, take that but uh, you know it might uh, be good something very simple to teach the kids about sportsmanship and uh, being a good player and when someone takes your card you just continue to play the game you don't cry or whatever then uh, that might be uh, be pretty good for all that kind of kind of learning and fun stuff so uh, I don't know if uh, it's as funny. You're not going to be like a George Carlin, you know, stand-up special, that kind of haha. -ha, but uh, it might be neat to goof up and be like, oh, you know, look, why does he have a bucket or she have a bucket on her head or whatever the case is. Uh, you might need to bring that comedy. But uh, otherwise, I think, yeah, there's some value to it. Then we have a new 5e adventure. This is from uh, Grant Ellis, and he's one of those guys that uh, does a bunch of uh, 5e uh, campaigns on Twitch. And uh, this is uh, one that's based on, it says Grimm, so like Brothers Grimm, it's a fairy tale world. Um, but you have a few differences. You can use 5e rules, but you have something called a narrador, and that's instead of your GM, and you uh, set up these masks instead of uh, just playing through the world. It's just uh, an interesting different type of, uh, of game. If you're an experienced RPG player, then this would be something fresh for the market. Uh, if you haven't played anything before, then it might be a little, di it might be too different for you than the things that are set up for new players. This is not specifically set up for a new player, but more just to bring something interesting and different to the market. Um, the art style is interesting. I like this Druid one the best. It's the one that's most like Art Nouveau. Uh, some of them are. Uh, you know, a little bit different than this, uh, more of a modern styling. Um, so it's kind of up to you what you want to do. Since the Feywild, ex the Feywild exists in D&D already, uh, you just really have to want something uh, that fits into a new campaign and a new mechanic, and the Narrador may be the thing that does it for this campaign. And if you want some two-tone dice, there you go. Roll your Fate dice. Um, you know, some of them are a little easier to see than others. It really is going to depend on what your favorite color is. Uh, depending on what character you're running, you might want dice theme to that character to help you out. Um, that part's all up to you. For me, there's one other dice campaign coming up that might be a little more interesting. Then we have a new sci-fi game and new in a lot of different ways. As you can see there in the bottom left corner, these things light up. It is expensive. $225 as a start. And uh, it's not like Kingdom Death where you got like hundreds of minis. Like, no, no, no. You get a couple dozen. But the minis that exist have microprocessors inside of them that run LEDs. I'm not sure how you have to charge each one uh, before play. So that could be a complication. And it's supposed to all basically run through an app. The cards themselves have RFID chips inside. So if you lose one or, uh, you know, spill something on something, then... Uh, and it gets destroyed, that could be, uh, the whole game could be gone. So you are going to have to consider that and the cost of having a tablet along with you and keep that thing charged so that you can play along. Uh, but otherwise, it has solo mode. So if you're playing by yourself, you can fix all these problems. Um, but otherwise, you want to prepare ahead of time for other folks. 
This is very, very interesting, very, very cool looking. Don't take anything away from that, but there are some complications. Uh, it does simplify quite a bit by using those RFID cards uh, and making the app perform a lot of the, uh, the, the nuts and bolts stuff in the background. Um, but yeah, if you want to colonize uh, some you know, new planet or anything, they have 700,000 plus planets for you to, uh, to venture over. It looks pretty neat. Then traveling back to low tech, we have the NPC Almanac. This is uh, people to put into your towns to populate them. Uh, just like if you needed that town uh, on the pocket companion from before, you could get this to go with it and basically just fill it full of people. You don't have to worry about that part. You can just worry about the overarching story. They come with backgrounds and uh, some interesting art uh, to throw in. Uh, lots of different types of people represented and uh, yeah, and make it a little bit easier on you to not have to uh, keep track so much. Uh, maybe just in your campaign log, you can say, oh, it's in this book and this character or whatever the case is, or photocopy the pages and uh, put them in your, your campaign log uh, to make things easier for you as a GM. So uh, yeah, or just you want to do a little bit of world building and uh, you want to think about other types of people or options you could have and you could use something like this just as inspiration. Then we have another RPG. This is Era Lost Legend, and they, as explicitly as possible, say that this is based on Final Fantasy. Uh, that could get them in a lot of trouble if Square finds out. Um, so if you want to back it, jump in. If it stays small enough, right now it's under 100 people, and it will fund. Then uh, you know it won't be too big, big a deal. But if this is too close in the art, or too close in the characters, or they actually use the names they need to worry about copyright problems. Uh, a lot of times with uh, Kickstarters, because it's not considered a store, it's considered a reward, you don't really have to worry too much about it. But uh, yeah, there are lawyers, they do exist. So, you know, just keep that part in mind. Um, but if you need something in an RPG space that plays like uh, Final Fantasy or has that inspiration, or you just wanted to go back and play some of those games, each one of those games have a different universe on every iteration, basically, except the giant chickens. Then, uh, yeah, you might uh, you might find some things that you wanted, or you know maybe you're not sure of because you didn't play the 12 previous games from whenever you started. Um, but uh, yeah, JRPGs are popular, and uh, they have their own type of storytelling. And maybe this is something you're a fan of and you want to bring to the table. Someone who's not going to have any copyright problem is Cobbled Press, because they have Raven Folk and Bear Folk, and uh, Ravens and Bears, unless they uh, they had the football team's jerseys on, aren't going to sue anybody. Uh, these look pretty cool. Um, if you are going to get Alter Quest, then you're going to get some uh, Crowl, which are uh, Raven people you could use. Um, there's other games you could have Bear stuff. Uh, I like the idea of it. Uh, bear people, I don't think there's... 5e doesn't have it as a race uh they do have the i, I don't want to mispronounce it ericora i think is the bird people you could already use the, these guys as uh something similar to them um but yeah there's a lot of different options or humblewood or any of the other campaigns that have come out um then uh that have anthropomorphic animal characters you could use these for uh, they look pretty neat, so take a look at it if that's something that interests you. You just want some uh, interesting painting challenge. That's another thing you can pick these up for. Then we have the latest Romantic Games, League of Infamy. This is a game about trying to raid a dragon's nest. The elves are, for some reason, breeding dragons, and you play a bunch of villains who are hired to run in and kill them all. All the eggs and whatnot, and you don't want to tip off the mother or she will blast you. Uh, so this is, it says it's semi-cooperative, so it requires at least two players. That's what kind of puts it out for me. Otherwise, the idea of, of raiding uh, for the purpose of uh, getting the dragon eggs is kind of neat. High fantasy, the minis look kind of neat. Um, you can use these for lots of other campaigns. They have square bases though, so maybe it will or won't work in other campaigns. That part's up to you. I've never had a problem with Mantic. I have uh, gotten the Hellboy uh, game from them. They have a lot of new Hellboy miniatures uh, for the holidays. Nimue is back and available for resin. I'm not a big fan of resin, so I probably won't pick those ones up. But uh, I've read a lot of people complaining about Mantic. They're never specific on whatever their complaint is. It's just general stuff. 
So I don't know if it's going to follow the same rule that whenever I hear a millennial complain, then I just ignore it. Um, just because I have a different set of expectations of what I'm supposed to get from uh, the people I work with and uh, go from there. So I think Mantic does a good job on minis. I think they did a good job on uh, Hellboy. I really enjoy that game and can't wait to play it even more. So that's up to you. What do you want to pick it up? Uh, but I think it's a fun idea at the minimum. Then we have a different type of dungeon crawl, the dungeon run. This is Mind Burners. And in this game, it's all driven by cars instead of minis. Uh, you have meeples and little energy cubes that uh, track on different cards and you use them to fight against the 10 card void deck and you get special abilities and different things and use energy as you go through. So you strategize as to when you use certain cards to defeat certain void problems and whoever makes it out with the most points at the end wins. So that means that you can play solo, you can play with friends, you can do whatever. Everything is very thematic in this uh, red, orange, yellow, black, and white theme. So all that uh, looks pretty neat. The uh, artwork is also, uh, you know, it's it's it fits really well. It feels to me a little bit like a like a late '80s, early '90s zines type of artwork. Um, so that part is pretty fun. If you liked Epic Spell Wars or any of the other games that also have that kind of art style, then this would fit in pretty well. Uh, it doesn't seem to take too much up of your table, so uh, that's another uh, neat thing. It has just the 10 rounds, so it depends on you how uh, long the games will take, but probably something you can finish over lunchtime, and uh, it has a very small uh, footprint and fits in the box pretty easy. And if you wanted something a little different out of Blood Rage, then Runoyod might be for you. This is also Viking themed. The uh, artwork looks really similar to the Adrian Smith stuff in that they would fit in that same universe together uh, in that they look pretty good. This has uh, those icy tundra tiles that you uh, can see there in the middle of the board and you play against those uh, and you uh, end up fighting crazy monsters of myth. So uh, if you wanted something that was more solo capable, uh, instead of using, uh, you know, a player versus player out of the Blood Rage minis, then this is something that uh, would probably scratch your itch. Or if you already have that game and you wanted something you could play solo, then this is also available for you for there. Uh, it also uses runes a little bit differently, so that becomes something that um, you can use in the game, uh, depending on how they play. Runes used for uh, storytelling and uh, divination and all kinds of uh, fun stuff like that. Uh, in the past, so it, it fits that kind of kind of feel. Uh, take a quick look if you're a big fan of Vikings. Then for the Hogwarts kids, or break bills, or whatever it is that you like to play or watch or whatever, then uh, Arcana Academy exists. Um, the artwork looks like it is skewing for a much younger crowd than you would have had with break bills. Um, it's powered by the Apocalypse is the system that it utilizes, so you don't have to learn whole new thing powered by the apocalypse plays with a lot of different of these indie type games um, you can get lots of different versions it has a nice uh, possible uh, game screen and other stuff like that uh, or you could just get a cheap digital copy that parts up to you depending on how you want to play and uh, I have reservations a bit when they say mystery and this that uh, is it gonna be good is it a good mystery is it just taking it from something else is it derivative I don't know but you never know that about any campaign um, if you have a, a big Harry Potter fan, then I think that's what uh, this is mainly going towards. Um, yeah, play with your kids, why not? Then we have a skirmish game for people that uh, want to fight current factions of uh, military might against each other. That's Delta 1-0. This uh, lets you play a bunch of different types of uh, military. So as you see there, it's the UK and Eastern Bloc. I don't know how accurate it is because it's made by someone in Australia. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, I don't see the Australian fighting forces in there, but, you know, maybe maybe in an expansion. Uh, the components simple, but uh, the minis look like they are representative, and uh, it's a skirmish game. So if you have a friend that uh, also likes to play these uh, types of games or you're trying to get someone involved and maybe they don't like fantasy, uh, this will help ground them in something that's a little... To maybe to them a bit more serious. Uh, it does come with a little, couple of obstacles to uh, to use as terrain. It's got some uh, shipping containers with a little graffiti on it from the look of it, um, but the uh, that's not limited to anything. You can use whatever tables and types that you want, but it looks like it's got all the basic components and uh, you know enough 
interesting enough rules. It's not going to be the same as other uh, skirmish games out there that uh, already um, bloat the space. So this this fits a pretty good little niche. Then we have some of the coolest looking dice I've ever seen. That is not an effect I put on. That is what the dice look like. They have some type of glitter or uh, snow uh, globe effect in them as you roll. This is awesome. They come in a lot of different colors. Uh, I'm seeing mainly D20s, um, but that's great if you have a D20, 5E, or whatever type of campaign. Uh, yeah, this is something that uh, will really, really um, shock the people at your table. If you throw this out there, if you use this for magic effects or anything, then it's going to add just that little extra bit of spice. I don't think it's going to show up if you're trying to do this for Twitch or anything else, but um, it would have to be as large as you see there to be able to see the speckles moving around. But at the table, it would look really cool uh, throwing these things around. Uh, if you do this and it works out, I don't think you're going to be able to play with any th other type of dice out there. People are going to be like, oh, it's just regular type. And uh, yeah, this really ups the game and uh, makes it, uh, you know, just something extra special. They're close to $200,000 uh, already. Um, these are supposed to be handmade, so I don't know if, how they're going to make all of these. <laughs> they're going to definitely have to figure out a machine to make it work in order to hit those kind of numbers. I'm guessing by the time they get to the end of the campaign, they're going to have like 5,000 people that want these. So, uh, yeah, quite a bit. Otherwise, um, yeah, maybe they're a victim of their own success out there in Ormond Beach, Florida. But, uh, yeah, really, really cool idea. And if you want to get your Raiders of the Lost Ark introduction on, this is Subterra 2, you know, you get the nice little meeples and whatnot, but the idea is you're supposed to run into a volcano, grab an artifact before the volcano explodes, and get out. Uh, I kind of like it. The uh, flipping of the uh, tiles, as you can see there, puts uh, the volcano uh, lava paths. You might get stuck uh, when trying to run away. And, uh, you know, it's a neat way to time things so it doesn't take too long. Um, you could have gone really crazy. There's some, uh, lava tiles that Dwarven Forge came out with. Uh, you could swap them out and just use the rules. Um, basically you could take the mechanics or idea of this and make an epic campaign, uh, with other game components, uh, if you wanted to. So, uh, yeah, a really neat idea, a lot of tension, a lot of, uh, speed and interest and, uh, keeps things exciting and a way to use simple components to keep everything exciting. You can't ask for more than that. Now, here is something for the Joe Rogan podcast viewer in your family or someone who uh, needs something to do when it's not hunting season, and that is Duck Buck Moose. This is a card game that you can play with multiple ages, but it's about going out and hunting. You need to use weapons uh, such as bows and rifles and whatever shotgun things that you're going to use. You have to prep yourself and then go out and try to hunt um, whatever type of animal that, you know, you want to eat that day, I guess. Uh, this is a little bit on the controversial side, I guess, because a lot of people don't like the concept of hunting. But then there's a lot of people pushing out there for hunter's rights and uh, the other uh, conservation and uh, programs and, and being able to uh, cull populations that are out of control that the hunting provides and uh, makes it so that, uh, you know, poor people can eat meat because uh, there's wild game available. Um, so that's what you're just basically working for. Uh, depending on uh, who you have in your room, they may work or may not work. Um, but uh, it seems to be a pretty simple game that has uh, included a lot of the frustrations involved with trying to hunt the thing that you are particularly looking for. You might pick up something else, but uh, you didn't get the thing you want. And uh, so that makes it uh, still a game. Uh, very kid-friendly in the artwork. It's almost South Park style uh, in the way that it looks. So, yeah, just uh, keep those uh, caveats in mind when you decide to pick it up about who you want to play with. Then we have one of the most prolific Kickstarter campaign folks out there, and that is Queen Games with their fresco box. These guys, I think, always have something up on Kickstarter. I think uh, right now, as of this recording, they have 54 uh, campaigns that they've created and put out there. Fresco is a game. That they've already have they already have expansions for um and this is just offering new things for you to play with them um it has a card game and a dice game it also offers uh these little pink and purple damsel meeples it's about uh, art making art and the renaissance era and uh yeah if you uh, if you are looking for something that's upgraded as a version that you have before 
or you just want new uh, components or you wanted to give Fresco a shot, then uh, this is one of the best times to go pick up that game because you can get all the all the fun stuff all together in one uh, place. And then we have more minis. This is the Inquisitor's line from Resin Lab. And you can get the STL files to print them on your own resin printer or you can get it from them. So those options are existing for you, which is kind of neat. Um, they're all sci-fi looking. Um, for the most part, I think you could use it with just about any skirmish game. It's in 20 millimeter scale, but uh, if you get the STL files yourself, you could scale it up to 30 or whatever makes, uh, makes it work for uh, the game that you're currently playing. Or uh, if it's something that you just want to have to paint uh, for your own hobby purposes, that's what this is all for. And uh, take a look at the full line. I tried to include as much as I could there on the left just to give you an idea that there's a lot of different options. And then we have a Koi Pond, Kohaku. Uh, these have acrylic tiles, so it's going to weigh a fair amount, but they're going to last and they're going to have uh, all this wonderful artwork on them. And it's not going to be cardboard, which could flip or uh, tear. So uh, it's going to cost a little more, but it's going to be awesome uh, when you get it on the table, especially if you like the relaxing uh, feel of sitting in front of a koi pond and watching little fish do their thing. So that's up to you if you uh, want that kind of component and you want that type of serene time. Kohaku may be for you. Then we have something that is based on a web series, Modest Medusa Miniatures. If you have a a friend or you yourself are a fan of the Modest Medusa, Modest Medusa cartoon or webcomic, then this would be something you'll be interested in. Otherwise, you have a chibi game, Super Dungeon Explorer, or something like that that you need uh, a different miniature and you want to have different experience of, then uh, this might fit really well into that chibi style or an RPG. Uh, or you uh, just need some uh, friendly... What are they, Yanti? The ones that have the, the legs of a, or no legs, they, they use a snake tail. Um, in in D&D &D 5e, you have a friendly one, one that runs a bar. I don't know. Lots of different options available for you uh, if you are a fan of this art style. Coming in from Thunder Bay, we have the Quick and the Undead. This is a Weird West game, which is awesome, uh, but it's a lot simpler than Hard West, what we saw before. This is... A uh, game of a town that's being overrun by zombies. You come in, uh, you compete against other people. You don't have to compete because you can play solo. And whenever you run into another gunslinger, then, uh, okay, let's put it this way. You do your actions in secret. When your actions are revealed, if two of you are in the same spot, then you're going to have a duel. The duel is when you fight another gunslinger and you're given those cards you can see on the bottom that have hit locations. You roll your D8 and if you hit one of those hit locations, that's how you score. And if you kill the other gunslinger, they come back as a zombie, so you have to clear them as a zombie. But uh, once all the zombies are cleared out, you can buy locations in the town and uh, use those to score your victory points. Very thematic, very interesting, very small, and very quick. So all of those are uh, good things if you want to get this to the table often. Artwork looks pretty amazing. It's uh, very similar to what you'd see in uh, most modern comic books, which is a good thing. And uh, it's just easy enough to figure out uh, how to play. It says ages 8 and up. Sure, why not? And if the post-apocalypse is more your thing, that's Roan out of the Czech Republic. This is a card game that includes all the expansions uh, that they have from before. Uh, Stefan Stefanik, it, it looks like he's created this uh, interesting world with mechs and uh, mutants and all kinds of crazy things that are vying to take back their place in the world. So, uh, in this, you know, nuclear war has gone past, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's got cards. It's a game. You need two players. And uh, it's already out there on the market, so you can see how other people play it and uh, see if it's something that you wanted to get. This is a great opportunity to pick up uh, a full game that um, maybe you'd have to piecemeal out um, with, uh, with other expansions from before. Now you can have it all in one place. Then we have Tremor, which is about climate change and disasters. It's not a very good name, I think, for what it is. that they're, It's not just about Tremor, things happening as earthquakes, and it's not about Tremors, the uh, movie series, so it could throw people off as to what the game is about. Uh, and it's, it's while it is about disasters, the uh, bright and shininess of the card components 
belies the uh, artwork on the box. So I, I think, you know, it's a little uh, incongruous as to uh, those different components and how they lay out with the theme. But the game is easy enough to play. Uh, the tiles move around as natural disasters happen, and uh, that changes the outlook of the game. You're supposed to try to get your species onto a different corner of the board uh, while shift, the tiles shift around, pushing you this way and that. One of the cool things that they're doing, though, is for every box that they sell, they're going to plant five trees, which means they're already at over 1,500 trees planted just by taking a look at this game. So uh, I'd like to see a lot more campaigns out there working with, uh, with folks to do that. Keep in mind, every tree that's planted sucks up 50 pounds of carbon per year. Yeah, neat, right? You're a big fan of Kill Bill and Max Payne, the video game, not the movie, because that one sucked. If you're like... Uh, just revenge movies in general, then Vengeance Director's Cut is a board game you may enjoy. This has really cool miniatures that have a lot of different factions that are based on what you would see in a stereotypical revenge movie. So they have like the Asian ones, they have Eastern European ones, they have all different types uh, of uh, things you'll see. You roll the dice and uh, you get whatever type of weapon or attack and uh, try to take out the minis as you make your way to the boss and defeat them finally. So, uh, yeah, they got a lot of really good reviews. It looks pretty neat. Um, it's a small game for right now, but uh, it'll probably pick up as it continues. The artwork looks fantastic, very similar to uh, a lot of really great indie comics and things that you would have seen on Vertigo and uh, other types of brands. Um, but, yeah, and the minis also look uh, very unique and interesting. It's all modern. It's not fantasy, but... Um, if you do have a different uh, ninjas and super spies or other type of uh, spy game that you want to use minis for, you can use this as well. So, pretty neat. And our last campaign is Void Heart Symphony. This is an RPG, even though you see cards and different things that are going on there. It is a tabletop RPG from that book that uses a system that Jay Isles developed with uh, Legacy, Life Among the Ruins, and Rhapsody of Blood. Uh, but it's basically a psychic rebellion uh, that you're trying to run. You're trying to be a dissenter and uh, how do you set that up? What type of organization do you set up? Uh, what types of things do you do to defy the authority? Or you want to play the authority and the rebels are going uh, you know, against you. So there's lots of different options and ways to play, uh, different ideas and things to think about. Um, when you don't want to play any more 5e, you just want to break, then Void Heart Symphony may be the punk rock thing that uh, you need to, uh, to make your heart uh, you know, just filled with the feelings of rebellion and, and uh, you know, being able to make a difference and all that kind of cool stuff that uh, young people love to to feel. So, yeah, why not? Do it. Void Art Symphony. Take a look because you can download a PDF. It basically explain, explains the rules and why they're different and how they're different, and uh, you can find out if it's for you. And that's it for me. As you can hear in the background for this whole episode, I got my 3D printers running, so they're going to be ending soon, and I got a bunch of stuff I got to work on. Uh, I hope you guys have a fine week. Keep in mind that uh, Hour of Need from Blacklist Games is coming out. That is their comic book and superhero based game. And Dawn of Madness has been pushed to the 19th because the people from Deep Madness uh, Dimension Games want everyone to get their Deep Madness pledges before they ask them for more money, which is as commendable as commendable gets. This week on Tuesday, Zombicide 2.0 is also finishing out. They uh, added Winston Churchill, Ronald Reagan, um, Sasquatch, uh, Man Bear Pig. They added uh, a lot of cool stuff to uh, to that game if you like Zombicide. Uh, so keep all that part in mind. Also, Black Friday is when Kingdom Death has their sales. So if you want to spend ridiculous sums of money or get the core box at its cheapest price uh, in order to jump in, then uh, that will be happening at the end of the month. So, you know, set aside five, six hundred bucks for that uh, because you're not going to just get the core box. You're going to get expansions. You're going to get all the stuff because it's all on sale. Um, keep that part in mind. Uh, lots of things also coming in. Uh, it's going to be week to week for the rest of the month just because there's so many things. And it'll probably be a lot of these combined episodes until Thanksgiving weekend. In which case, I will spend all of Thanksgiving weekend trying to get ahead on as many campaigns as possible. Uh, and that's just going to be my month. So you guys have a wonderful weekend, uh, whatever's remaining of it, week. I uh, hope all that goes well for you. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a good time.